Good evening, YouTube. Welcome to uh, episode two of the Midlife Pilot Podcast, the live stream recording. Uh, my name is Chris Moran, uh, known as the Midlife Pilot on my YouTube channel, and uh, I'm glad you're here tonight uh, for this next episode. Sorry for the not having our fancy uh, intro tonight. Countdown timer, technical difficulties, things are uh, off to a roaring start, but i um, certainly glad you could join us tonight. Uh, for episode two, where tonight we're going to talk about some of the challenges uh, that have to do with uh, learning to fly later in life, as opposed to maybe learning to fly um, in school or right out of school and some of the things that go along with that. So a couple of quick things I want to point out. Um, actually, before we even point anything out, let's uh, bring in some other folks uh, so I don't have to do this all by myself. <laughs> and let's st <laughs> let's start with, of course, uh, co-host and uh, producer of the Midlife Pilot podcast, uh, one Brian Siskind uh, from the greater Nashville region. What's <laughs> up, Brian? What's going on? Uh, no worries on the technical difficulties as long as we have them here on the ground. Exactly. Better, better here than in the air, for sure. Um, so tonight's going to be exciting. Uh, we're going to get into things here in just a few minutes. We're bringing a special guest, uh, someone that you've seen on the channel, some uh, one of the folks who have been a part of my learning experience, uh, Kevin Webb, CFII is going to join us to talk about this from a CFI's perspective. Certainly, uh, he's got a lot of familiarity with um, students of all ages, so we'll get into that with him uh, coming up here in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk briefly about the podcast. So if you were with us last week, it was the inaugural episode. It's now available as an audio podcast, which is kind of the intention all along of the whole of the whole thing. Uh, it's out there uh, just about everywhere that you would get a podcast. It's on uh, Apple Podcasts. It's on Google, um, Spotify, um, Anchor, um, pretty much everywhere that you can get your podcast. So if you uh, if you're interested in doing that, knowing you maybe you won't be able to watch every one of these live, probably. Uh, do go out and subscribe to them wherever you get your podcasts um, so that you can um, follow along. And if you're going to do that, we'd appreciate uh, taking a minute to give us a rating and maybe a comment or two if you're on various platforms. Uh, just to let us know what you think. And um, we would appreciate that. Yeah. Make sure you comment also. That's the other part of this show is uh, pretty heavy driven from uh, interacting with users and, and the comments from our viewers that we're getting uh, throughout the live stream. Right. That's exactly right. So it um, doesn't matter what platform you're seeing it on, but you're probably on YouTube. Uh, feel free to throw, throw some words at us, some thoughts, questions, hopes, dreams, maybe not so many desires, but everything else. Yeah. What's, uh, what's been going on? You've been flying any? Uh, yeah, I have. I actually had probably one of the coolest flights I've had. If Actually, no, it was the coolest flight I've had, um, especially since I got my license. But um Last weekend, we went a uh, bit of a cross country. It was only about 60 miles east of here, but we went to Jackson County Airport, which is out east uh, over Center Hill Lake and just north of there. And this little airport is, it was unbelievable. It was the coolest approach I've ever uh, been able to do. It's just, it's right, the runway is about 4,000 feet, uh, but it's right exactly on the river bank. So you're just coming in around these hills and, and this really neat approach and, it was me really getting a taste for the first time of sort of like uh, what I really wanted to do in the beginning, which is to explore new places and just go to all these random spots that I've never had the ability to get to before in this way. So um, anyway, we had a great flight and everything went uh, totally smooth. The only thing that was weird that happened was uh, I was going to land at uh, Smithville Airport, which is right there at Center Hill Lake first. Uh, so that I could put on uh, my cameras and record this amazing approach into this other airport. And, uh, uh, I was getting, we got into Smithville and it was one of those things where there was about a hundred airports on the same CTAF and it was just a bunch of like, it was so crazy that, um, I was like, you know, what? I, we don't even need to bother with this. <laughs> like I, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't make out one transmission that was about the airport I was trying to go to. And, uh, it's like a weird, awkward new pilot kind of thing, but you know, I probably could have just kind of bowled my way in there and looked around, you know, but it was like, I didn't need to be there. So like, why am I going to put myself through that? But anyway, so I didn't get any video footage of it. So that's awesome. Uh, and that was the best uh, flight I've had yet. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. I hadn't flown for a month. Um, mm. uh, almost, almost a month since the, uh, our anniversary trip. Um, and later in September, uh, sneak peek, hold on. Uh, 
I love awkward the video, promotion the break. Yeah. Awkward promotion break. New video coming out Sunday. Uh, part two of the uh, of the anniversary trip will be our uh, return trip to Fairmont, which includes uh, some pretty exciting uh, trips through uh, clouds and stuff getting back into Fairmont. It was pretty exciting. Uh, so there's some of that coming up. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody that will be available. It's available for patrons right now, but it will become available publicly, uh, coming up uh, on Sunday. Anyway, I hadn't flown since that weekend. Um, and got a chance to go out the other night. It's been kind of cruddy here for VFR pilots, uh, with cloud cover and stuff lately. So, um, but I got to go out with Cecilia the other night. We did video that flight. We took about an hour kind of sunset. E, uh, reasonably decent ceilings but like uh it was nice some fall foliage just pretty time here in west virginia um so we just kind of made a quick loop around did a couple in clarksburg and then came back to fairmont but um yeah so that's the first time i've flown in like a month but it was good to get back um nice we'll talk we'll talk to kevin when he's in a little bit to a uh, new series coming soon to the uh, road to instrument series will be starting mm-hmm. we're gonna start kevin put a syllabus together for me we're gonna start the instrument training here coming up um pretty shortly yeah, it's kind of like yeah. you uh do you feel like you kind of missed the pain of learning uh just for the like in the way that you went about your private pilot it's hard for oh, anybody yeah. <clears throat> and so now do you feel like now that you're out of that that part of this i mean of course you want to have an instrument rating and have what's available to you uh and be a better pilot and all that and continue the learning but at the same time i feel like there's a part of us that just i've already started to feel this a little bit where i'm like where's the like now I just can get in a plane and fly around and like, okay, like this is great. I mean, it's amazing. It's a life dream, but where's the pain that goes along with it? Yeah. Do you remember like, do you remember the studying like leading up to the check ride and in the written test, even like it was, it was nonstop effectively. I had audio books in the car every second yeah. that I was in the car. And now I'm looking back and I'm already thinking like, I got to go back and look up. So, you know, I knew all these figures by heart. I could have recited everything by heart. And now like I'm planning a cross country that flies over a, uh, like a wildlife area. And I'm like, what, what is the altitude? I don't even, I don't, I got to look it up. Cause I don't remember, you know, I don't remember what altitude is it's like that stuff, but I've already started, uh, I've started to pull some material for um, like ground school stuff for the instrument. And I'm thinking, I remember how this was not super fun, like the studying part. So like, I'm, I'm excited to do the flying part. I think, you know, really kind of um, getting in the plane and doing that stuff. It's like anything else Who, who's excited for the book work, but, but it's part of it. So um, no, I'm looking forward to getting back into some of that again to like, um, yeah, looking forward to get back into kind of the learning again, instead of just, you know, I don't know, some more uh, missions to the flights, I guess, or some, you know, some things to come out of it. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, that's awesome. And I think that, um, and that kind of leads into our topic a little bit too, which uh, for those who aren't counting, uh, what we really wanted to talk about tonight is kind of specifically the challenges of being a person that's not a spring chicken and, and taking this on for reasons that are not to go to ATP uh, or some other professional uh, application. It's just you're doing it because the challenge or because you love it or because you, you know, maybe you thought about doing it your whole life and just never got around to it. And I think there's a lot of people in this boat um, and I think there's a special set of kind of uh, 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 sort of pleasures and pains that go along with that. It's very gratifying in a particular way, uh, but it's also particularly di- more difficult maybe in some ways. And so I wanted to kind of uh, make sure that we we covered a lot of that and want to hear what everybody else has to say about their, their sort of experiences uh, compared to, you know, perhaps when they were a, a little younger. I know that like for me, having a, a fully formed frontal lobe and having a brain that can uh, process um, danger and consequences, um, you know, being a little bit more cognizant of things and having maybe a little bit more to lose uh, than maybe I did when I was 21. That's maybe a, a good starting place as it's, uh, it's really just about where you are in life and how you think and you want to value this thing and you, uh, you know, this pursuit, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, maybe you're not in as much of a rush or, or you know, or whatever. Uh, but, you know, for me, it was a lot of, a lot of things. I'm really interested to hear what people have to say and, and, and want to hear your point of view, Chris. But for, for me specifically, it was something that I, I, I think that I focused on it and learned more and was more disciplined about it now than I would have been when I was younger, uh, just like anything else. I think there's some of that. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I think there's some of that for sure. It's, 
things change a lot. I was not a great student of anything. I mean, I, I did right. well in high school, you know, I had a scholarship. I went to college. I didn't finish college. Uh, you know, I, I was in college for three semesters. I did not, I did not have the discipline to do well on my own in an environment like college. I just didn't, uh, I didn't care enough. Um, I didn't, um, I don't know. It was, I would not have done well at 20. Now some, I know there are plenty of people cause I know a lot of them who, who did take it very seriously at that age and who did do very well with it, but it would have been terrible for me. I think there's a cost aspect of it too. You know, I mean, some of it is you, you know, it's kind of like you say, it's um, <laughs> when it's your own, you know, you realize every, what every minute, you know, at some points during my training, I was counting like, you know how much every minute of time that I'm in the plane with the instructor and the engines running, like how much this costs every minute. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to waste that. I didn't want to take it for granted. I didn't want to um, spend any more than I needed to, uh, obviously. Uh, but it's different when it's your, when it's coming out of your pocket and you're earning the money to pay for it. And it's so, yeah, I definitely think there's some of that. And I think we'll get a lot of great insight from, uh, from Kevin and some others on that. So um, I think we should bring Kevin in. What do you say? Let's do it. Kevin Webb, many of you have uh, seen him, talked to him, uh, not talked to him, maybe commented on some of our videos that he's flown with us. Uh, I'll let you talk about it, Kevin. Thanks for doing this. was short notice. I texted Kevin like 20 minutes before. I'm like, hey, do you want to come talk about this from a CFI's perspective? But uh, tell us about you briefly. I mean, most of the people know you. I've, I've set you up pretty well. Like instructor at Fairmont State, how long you been doing that? You know, when did you get your certificate? Uh, how many hours you have? How much you fly every week? You're teaching a ton. Just a little bit about your, uh, about your story. Likes, dislikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. I'm, uh, glad to be here guys. So thanks for having me on. Um, so yeah, I, uh, like Chris said, I'm a uh, full-time CFI, a double I at Fairmont State University. It's a, uh, part 141 flight school, uh, located here in Fairmont, West Virginia. Uh, so I started that program uh, the summer of 2018 after a year at WVU in aerospace engineering. So then I picked up uh, flight training after I decided you know, in the engineering wasn't exactly the route I wanted to go. So uh, I started my private uh, summer of 2018, um, went through all of my ratings uh, rather quickly, um, as 141 schools tend to um, do push their students through. Uh, so I ended up uh, getting my CFI and double I um, four days apart actually in January of um, 20, 2020. So I've been instructing for almost um, two years now. Uh, so, so I have uh, 100 hours now uh, on my way to ATP, hopefully looking at an airline here in the near future. Um, awesome. Yeah. And then ever since the. Uh oh. Oh, the suspense. I want to know what's coming next. I know. Ever since the what? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like he's got really good things to say. We just can't hear them. This is a pretty good reenactment of what it's like to have uh, a conversation with a CFI, though, when you're a student. <laughs> <laughs> it is. He doesn't know we can't hear him. Oh, oh, man. That's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Well, you know, one of, one of the things that my CFI said um, about uh, having, say, someone my age as a student uh, versus maybe some other younger students is, you know, he said that he's had plenty of experiences where the students that he had you could tell that, you know, the parents were sort of motivating or pushing the child to kind of go do this thing or that maybe even bankrolling it. People that are just kind of there because they just, it's a, it's a cursory requirement or exploration for them on some level as opposed to something they're just madly possessed, you know, uh, to, to accomplish or do. So he really liked having, he really likes having people like, like me come through that are just, you know, uh, really motivated, you know, and really purposeful about the whole thing. He, you know, he said I was the most prepared, you know, um, student that he ever had. Um, mm -hmm. and it was just, and that's, that goes back to that, that whole thing of like, uh, I'm not messing around. This does cost a lot of money per minute. And, uh, you know, I might not pick this up at the same rate in some ways as perhaps somebody that's a little younger, but I'm going to work, 
I'm going to make up for that with a, with a work ethic that is not going to be uh, compromised by anything. So. That's right. So Kevin, in your training time, so you, you obviously teach at the university and so you're seeing students, college students uh, all day long uh, in training. So what about the, I mean, what are your like, okay, big picture, like top down overview of like some of the key differences between teaching like students there. And then in the last year or so, you've had a lot of chances to fly with some older folks, like folks in the club, uh, the flying club that you've been training. What do you have some thoughts on just like overview? Like what are some of the big, are there differences that you've noticed between those? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, it's like some of the things you guys brought up earlier. Um, You know, one of the big things is um, a little bit, the dedication uh, factor, you know, sometimes where students kind of get swamped with, you know, the workload of a 141 uh, curriculum and working on a college degree program, um, you have to be a very dedicated um, individual in order to succeed in that kind of an environment. So the ones that do uh, dedicate themselves and put themselves 100% into the aviation uh, tend to succeed, um, but there are just as many um and I think that has to do with uh, some of the maturity, uh, a factor of students that, you know, they they struggle to find that balance of, between, you know, school and flying. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of other distractions and things with parties and having the social life uh, that can distract you from flying, which uh, really isn't to the benefit of of your flight training um but yeah it's been it, it has opened my eyes you know training with the club you know getting with some older members um they uh seem to have found more they're more able to dedicate themselves um i don't know whether like i said it was maturity uh, a factor or um but they seem to be, be more dedicated and uh really more dedicated in their studies you know, that, that seems mm-hmm. to be one of the first thing that slips in the college students is, is their studies and their ground knowledge and being prepared for flights. That's good stuff. Yeah. That's been my observation too. Um, that I, even though, although I say it's not maturity, I mean, I, I ground was hard for me. I mean, that was hard for me to force myself to do the, you know, it's not fun. You're not flying the plane, but I, I do, uh, yeah, I can relate to that for sure. Got, um, <laughs> I have to post this up here. Uh, one dog geek says, uh, it's hard to determine which team is Kevin's favorite. I don't know if you can tell from the, uh, from the background here of the, uh, of the room there, who is, who's his, uh, supporters for, but, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, a mountaineer. <laughs> yeah. That's I, awesome. I feel like uh, yeah, the, the room's been like this for a while. I feel like I probably wouldn't have passed the I'm safe checklist until I was about 26 on any given day. I I was not going to meet that criteria. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of the college students. um, You know, when we talk about that, I list a lot of these college students, um, you know, we talked about you guys mentioned the financial side of things a little bit ago. Uh, a lot of these college students are working one, sometimes even two or three part-time jobs, um, you know, waking up early morning hours, working till late and then trying to come in and fly, uh, you know, the next day at either an early morning flight where they were up late the night before or a late night flight where they've been up since 4 a.m. And uh, those are all factors that really contribute to um, a deteriorating performance with that fatigue uh, that uh, definitely sets in and becomes a I've turned down a lot of flights. I mean, I've wanted to fly in evenings a lot of times before, but I've just decided not to because I didn't feel, I just was just completely exhausted from just life or from the day and thought, you know, I don't, you, you never take a chance, right? You mean you go, that checklist should be part of every, every flight plane, but especially when you're just saying like, I just want to go up and putz around for no reason. Um, there's really no reason. Um, you know, it's, uh, so I think that probably happens for different reasons for people who are, in different stages of life too. Um, do you notice any, how about like, here's a good question. So since I never got the experience of trying to fly at a young age, 
Like what do you notice any difference in the in pilots pilots abilities to um, the muscle memory stuff, the physical stuff, like the aptitude for picking that stuff up? Do you notice a difference in that and based on p- the ages of the of the students? Um, surprisingly, a little bit. Yes, this conversation with with Bill, you know, one of my students in the club, uh, when we were working on his. Uh, uh, hood work when we introduced his flight by reference to instrument instruments. So, yeah, I do think um, I have noticed that the younger uh, college aged crowd seems to have they they pick up on things a little quicker and retain a little bit um, more, and they have a, seem to have a little bit more of a uh, hand eye coordination. I don't know how much truth there is to it, but um, I kind of relate a little bit of instrument flying to like a video game a little bit. And I feel like, you know, some of the, the younger generation has kind of grown up with that. Um, and for you guys, midlife guys might've, I mean, you guys might be into it now. Um, but obviously didn't grow up much of that. Like we have today. The, the Atari so 2600 was not nearly as demanding. <laughs> no, <laughs> you play pong. Brian spent a lot of time with like uh, on pong. That was his kind of, when he was a kid, that's where he was at. That's right. But I do have a quick question for you. Um, so from a CFI perspective, I've heard, somebody said this somewhere, and I thought, that sounds accurate, but I wanted to see if you thought that this was correct. That basically, because there's just all these conversations about like soloing, right? Like, when am I going to solo? And, mm-hmm. you know, what's what's normal hours to solo? And it's it's a ridiculous conversation because the context and the environment and so many things matter to that. However... It seems if you had to pick a general rule that you can take your age and half it and it'll be that many hours. Now, this is true, maybe except for Chris, who soloed at 1.3 hours uh, uh, no, that's or something crazy incorrect. like that. Right? I think he soloed nine, on his, a Discovery nine. flight. Nine. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> but what do you think about this half your age uh, kind of phenomena? Because I, I here's the thing that's frustrating for me. I'm 49. I don't feel any different. I don't feel like I've lost coordination. I feel like I'm still mm-hmm. moving around and doing all the things. But I, there is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the things are running a little slower upstairs, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have heard that before. I don't believe in it from my experience. Yeah. So... I've seen, you know, 16-year-olds. Uh, we actually trained uh, some 16-year-olds at Fairmont State over the summer, 16, 17-year-old uh, high school age group. Um, you know, some of them were up into the 20s even before their first solo. Um, and I've had students in the club, uh, midlife pilots, learn to fly, you know, that were 10 or 12 hours uh, solo. Um, so it can fall anywhere um in there so i don't i don't i don't think there's a ton of ton of truth uh in that it all depends on uh you know your dedication um i think more so contributes to your consistency of flying how often you're able Mm -hmm. to two or three times a week that helps a whole lot more um than Mm -hmm. whether you know like once a week or every other week Uh, that consistency seems to be a a lot better determining factor of uh, when that solo is going to happen. For sure. There was a, we had a question actually that kind of related to that uh, earlier from one dull geek who said after asking me after not having flown for a month, how long did it take you to get the rust off? That's an interesting, like that used to be a huge factor for me in training. Like I remember when I was working on my primary stuff, like I felt like if I didn't go out every few days that it was like, I just felt a little bit, weird um that is getting and kevin can probably tell me whether this is like normal i mean this that is all that's getting less and less of a factor i don't know that it took me when we left you know we got did our checklist and got to the runway we were it was about a smooth honestly i told cecilia when we were doing you know a lot of with the video part we talked about this last week it takes me longer to get in than it just takes a while that was the smoothest in the plane to the runway takeoff probably i think from the time we got in the plane and we're starting up we were taking off on the runway like six minutes which that's pretty good for me but like that entire flight i didn't necessarily feel like there was any i mean i don't know that it would have mattered if i'd have flown two days before or the three weeks before it didn't really seem to make that much of it i mean i didn't notice anything specifically that felt weird and i think that probably just comes with reps like anything else like it's kind of like the bike riding thing like i 
when you're first starting out, it would probably be hard to like go three weeks, you know, if you had 10 hours total and like went three weeks, you'd probably be like, this is, I don't know. But I think the more you do it, it just kind of becomes, uh, it's like anything else with flying. I've to- told people this before. Things that used to take all my attention, like airspeed and all the phases and like, you know, in the pattern and like just, it took me, it was all I could do to like figure out to, how to manage that stuff. You start to feel that differently and that starts to become, um, you know, it just becomes more natural. Don't you, how, did that, you, do you notice that even now, Brian, like it, it's gotta mm-hmm. be different because you're flying a lot more, but like those, it becomes less of a big deal. At least that's how I felt it to be. No, absolutely. And there's a couple of levels to that too. Another part of that I think is um, after you get your license and just not having the constant evaluation of an instructor happening right next to you at all times, there's some sort of extra taxing sort of element that that is. I want to perform well. I want to, I mean, I want to do that in the plane by myself, but there's some other taxation that happens um, with that. So I I feel like uh, now that I'm on my own, um, I can kind of relax a little bit. It doesn't mean I'm slacking on anything. In, in fact, I'm probably um, just as strict or more strict about you know pre-flight and everything else. But but it just it it flows so much more easily because I'm not worried about something. And you, the, the context of the training environment, even if you're not flying, you're you're weighed down and your brain is divided by so many things, all the studying and all of that. And then also you you find yourself thinking, you know, uh, how much is this costing? I need to do this the most efficient way possible. I don't want to extend this any longer. And and if you're thinking about scheduling for a check ride and you're thinking about, you know, weather and environment and you know what, like, I don't want to do this when it gets too hot or, you know, because then it'll be 95 degrees every day and I don't want to have a check ride when it's 95. Like you have all these other reasons to kind of compress everything. So yeah, in my experience, uh, since it's been kind of, um, a little bit more, yeah, just relaxed and automatic and, and nice in that way. So for Kevin, that's what we were getting to. And one dog geek asked perfectly, the, what I, is what I was saying, something you've seen t- true for others, that the rust builds up more for students and it becomes less of a deal the more hours you get. you find that to be true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah a real good example of this. Um, actually, you know, last year with uh, the whole pandemic and the, the COVID shutdown, our flight school got shut down. You know, for uh, uh, it was about four months uh, there when everything first was getting started, um, and you could obviously tell there was a big difference between you know people that were working on their private, uh, you know, were getting close to solo, um, and then had that four month stoppage essentially of of not flying. Um, it took them you know a significant amount of time uh, to get back to the the point where they were soloing, whereas. You know, we got had some students in, in or late instrument or even into commercial um, where that rust, you know, a flight, maybe two. They were they were right back where they were um, before our, our, our shutdown there. So, yeah, it, definitely the more experience you have, um, like the more experience you want to come back, um, you know, when you get back into the plane. That tracks that tracks for me as well. Let's see. What do, I, do you want to run through questions? You got something else, Brian? You want to run through some uh, chat? Yeah, let's, I'm looking let's, for let's some dig stuff. into the chat yeah, and see what's going on. We got a bunch of such stuff. This is cool to see everybody kind of talking amongst themselves in here during this thing. Uh, our boys since they just fly, started flying again after 13 years of not flying. That is awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, back to the video game <laughs> conversation. Uh the oh, Tandy yeah, the 1000 Tandy. did have limitations. Kevin knows nothing about those limitations, I would imagine. Not a clue. Do you remember in television? Not a clue. I do not. In television was, was real cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not a gamer now. Oh, by the way, Chris, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I've never used a flight simulator ever and once in my entire life. And so I don't even wow. have that to sort of go by. Um, I guess I just want to do the real thing all the time, <laughs> but, but I, I would probably be a lot better if I had used a SEM. I'm sure once I get to instrument uh, training, that'll be just a necessary thing. It definitely helps. We could, I mean, we could talk about that if we want to. I mean, there's, uh, I've said this before, it definitely helped me with um, 
radio stuff. I mean, for years before I was flying, I was doing flight sim with VATSIM. I don't know if anybody's used that over the years. It's like a virtual air traffic simulation that's been around for a long, long time. And much like there's people like me flying and playing on a flight simulator of some form, there are other people sitting there looking at radar scopes and there's a, you run a little plug in and it connects and they can see you and you do all the things they talk to you. So that was great for a long, long time. And then uh, more recently, um, Pilot Edge is another service that came along. It's a paid service um, that I paid a subscription for. They staff it with real people, like really good hours, and basically get the whole California or the Western Coast um, coverage. All of the real coverages, though. Like, I mean, every position is covered in a lot of cases. You got ground and tower and approach and center, and all of them are clearance delivery. Like, it's the real deal. And I spent a lot a lot of time flying uh, on those platforms and working on radio communication. Um, And so that was completely, that entire part was taken off of my plate. Like I didn't think about it from lesson one. Like the radio was never, some people that's a big hurdle, like just to get over the idea of the things you have to talk about or things you do. It never once to me was, I didn't, it was not a stressful thing. It wasn't a part of it. So I think, as far as the flying for like learning to like get the feel of the airplane and fly and like primary training, I don't think you get a ton of like, it just doesn't track, but definitely for instrument that I've already kind of started looking at some ways that people are using simulators for like instrument for sure. Cause if you, basically you're, you know, you're working on approaches and holds and procedures that are documented that you can replicate. It doesn't matter how the plane feels to fly. You've gotten past that, right? Or like what you see out the graphics, you see out the window, who cares? Don't show an outside view. I mean, the idea is you're not looking outside anyway. So I think from the instrument and kind of further on, that's probably a big, uh, probably a big help. Whoops. There, that looks better. There's a question. Just a couple, uh, Johnny Williams has a question for Kevin. I see it. Yep. Let's put that in here. Would you recommend part 141 or part 61 for instrument? That is a good question. Yeah, so all the that I've ever done has been through the 141 school. Chris will actually be my first part 61 instrument student. Um, the biggest difference between the two trainings is obviously going to be your amount of time with an instructor. So... You know, under Part 141, um, at least our approved syllabus is 35, at least 35 hours, um, and that's all with a double I. Um, and then the Part 61 requirements, um, you do have the additional cross country, the 50 hours of cross country requirement to meet, um, but only 15 uh, hours required with a double I. Um, the rest of your, your hour requirement can be made up safety pilot uh, under the hood. I personally don't have a strong opinion on this yet. Um, I do feel like more time in a plane with a CFI than 15 hours uh, is going to be extremely valuable uh, in an instrument setting, especially um, just because there are so many procedures and regulations uh, that really make up the whole instrument flying and uh, having that double eye there to kind of guide you through um, the the IFR world, uh, I think is more beneficial uh, in a pilot, but we will definitely see how um, Chris's instrument training goes here as we get started on that, hopefully here real soon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited to see how that works too. And uh, so 15 hours did seem a little, a little thin to me. And one of the things we talked about, Kevin and I've already kind of talked about up front is I do want to spend, so I've met, I have met my 50 hours, uh, PIC cross country time, which is one of the requirements, but I have not met, I, I forget whatever the hour count is, um, simulated or actual time, whatever it is, uh, just flight by reference to instruments. A lot of that you can do, like Kevin said, with a safety pilot, But Kevin and I have already talked about the importance. There's an important part of that, which is having time with an instructor already where you've learned the, the scan, your scan technique is solid and you're doing things the right way. Cause it does you no good to just run out and jump in a plane with somebody else and just go develop all these terrible habits that you're going to have to undo at some point. So we're going to be pretty intentional up front when we start to do some of that work very early 
before I set off with these other guys in the club who want to go and we can just like work, you know, on that stuff together. So I think that's a key. If you're going to try to do this outside of the flight school environment, you know, where it's a little bit more flexible with what you do. Um, I think it's probably important to get the fundamentals, make sure you have enough time with an instructor who's comfortable with you going out with somebody else just to, to build the time at that point. Like make sure you've got a fundamental stuff, uh, down first um here there's some good questions here um related to instrument training or maybe i don't know if uh, indiana penny's asking about if this is for instrument or for private any advice or preference for an online ground school this is probably for all of us i don't know uh i can say that i i don't know for instrument yet because i haven't done all the research i know for my private i used a handful um I used um, a, a, a Gold Seal Aviation. That's Russ Still's uh, program. I used that for private. He doesn't do anything beyond private, I don't think. Uh, it was pretty good. Uh, Chris Palmer, angleofattack.com, has an online ground school a video series that he offers um, that I did use throughout. Those were the two primary ones. And then Sporty's actually, to be honest, Sporty's private course I thought was really good. I've heard mixed reviews about their instrument. Like it's a little shallow and like the videos are really sweet and polished, but it's like the content is a little lacking. So I don't know what I'm going to do yet um, for instrument, but I'm definitely looking for a course there. Do you have any, have you, do you, Kevin, do, I can't remember if we talked about this. Do you have any insight? Mm -hmm. Um, not really, as far as the online ground schools go. Um, all of our ground schools in the flight school are strictly through uh, uh, through an Anderson ground school. Uh, use the Glime uh, packages for that. They, they do offer a, an online ground school as well. Uh, uh, we seem to have uh, good luck with all their content and uh, typically with a, a, a solely online ground school, so I'm not completely positive uh, on that end of things. What, I have a quick question for Kevin. Yeah, yeah, I've hit it. So given that uh, you've already given us more than anecdotal evidence that we as the older set are not quite all there, right? We don't have all the capacity. The, you know, anyway... Given that older people maybe get a little bit slower at things uh, like this, and you, and you specifically mentioned instrument, I guess I'm just curious about um, in the either the build up to pursuing instrument or considering it, or actually being you know in the process of getting that rating. What particular observations or advice might you have for people that are you know midlife? pilots you know is there anything unique that you can see that might be better is it something where uh in-person ground school would be better than an online ground school or uh any number of other things um just curious um the as far as the grass um that has to do i think a lot with your specific learning style uh whether you learn better from from videos or or from an in-person uh, you can interact with someone there. Um, and like I said, I don't have a great experience or a ton of experience around school stuff. As far as the flying goes uh, for instrument, uh, like I kind of mentioned earlier, consistency is most definitely going to be the key uh, to that. So staying in the plane, keep developing that uh, instrument panel scan. Uh, that's a solid scan. So more and more procedures on, you know, things like holds and approaches. That, that that basic scan is is already there, um, and then even you know we talked about flight simulators a, a little bit ago. Even the at home flight simulators, um, you know, I have just a basic you know SciTech yoke and throttle quadrant um, with X Plane Eleven on my laptop, and it did great for me all the way through instrument training. Um, you know, the flight school I was bouncing back and forth between a six pack and a G one thousand. So I had and X Plane 11 has both of those uh, in, in the default. So I could go back and forth practicing procedures on, on, on both aircraft and uh, really um, develop panel scan. And then even the procedures of working my way through the, 
GPSs loading the approaches and uh, and flying those at home home for practice before you know I actually went and got in the plane. But the flight sim will uh, I think definitely helps, especially for instrument. Got it. What uh, one dog geek asks what. Kevin, what do you think would be a good number of hours that, you know, we were talking earlier about the minimum, you know, it feels like 15 is maybe not, uh, you know, more would be better. Do you have, do you have an uh, idea of a number or is it really more dependent on like the student, you know, is it case by case, do you think? Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely, uh, falls more along the line of case by case basis, depending on how the students progressing, you know, like our syllabus that we kind of laid out, uh, Chris, we have 20 hours uh, planned with the CFI. So I think anywhere in the realm of 20 to 25 um, with a double I in the plane should cover all your bases and give you a good foundation you know, for those last 10 or 15, 20 hours uh, with a safety pilot. Very good. I have, a, I have actually another question. Uh, I'm, I'm right here. I have a microphone. I thought I would just ask. But um, so... Chris is going right into instrument, obviously. Um, and, you know, for me, I just got my uh, certificate, a, you know, a month ago. And my inclination is to just give it a minute, um, recover financially, spiritually, um, intellectually, uh, work-wise, you know, whatever all the things are that I've sort of put off and had to, you know, sort of put it aside to focus on. I'm, I'm kind of just regrouping while staying at it and trying to fly, you know, once a week, even if it's just for pattern work or something, just to stay in it and stay on it and keep giving myself a little bit of a new challenge each time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, and I definitely want to get an instrument rating, of course, but I don't see myself doing it soon. I don't see myself doing it for probably, I don't know, a year, you know, uh, something like that, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, it's just going to take me that long to kind of, recover and turn the corner and refocus and get stocked up on, uh, you know, some imaginary money that's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen with that. But maybe, uh, let's get, turn your super chat on, uh, Chris, let's get this thing cooking. Um, <laughs> oh God, is it not on? Yeah. So, um, but I guess I'm just curious, you know, uh, for, I'm still thinking, well, I should at least try to make the most of it, right. Get, get cross country time, uh, you know, anything I can do to sort of consciously, you know, if I have the choice between flying somewhere that's 47 miles or 62 miles, fly the place that's 62 miles and get that in the books, right? So that's about as far as I can think about it. But I guess I was curious for you um, to tell me, it's a student who's going to do it, but it's not doing it now. How can I intelligently set myself up for it while I'm kind of in this middle period? Yeah, definitely. Um, like you said, build, building that cross-country time, uh, can definitely be a hold up for some people. Um, so any chance you get on building the cross country time, uh, if you're going to pursue instrument part 61 it is definitely to your advantage. The other thing I would say is just try to stay as consistent as you can in your flying, just to stay in the plane. Um, so all those procedures from private, you know, the, the basic airplane flying skills, um, are still there. Um, so you don't, you know, take big gaps and let, uh, some of those skills, that you have fresh out of training uh, kind of deteriorate um, over the year or so um, that you're uh, just, just enjoying the privileges, you know, of a private pilot. Um, so I would say you def will definitely enjoy instrument training and it's rewarding uh, when you do, you'll find out. Um, and Chris is kind of, will enjoy this. Um, when he gets his instrument rating, you're not as limited, you know, on, on flights and, and cross countries, you know, and there's a little bit of a cloud layer. Uh, but as for right now, um, I think with what, what you're wanting to do, just kind of, you know, fly around, take small trips with the family here and there. Um, you know, what, what you're doing is perfectly, perfectly fine um, to take that little break there, kind of reset. And, and it gives you a chance to kind of really enjoy flying and, and get out of the training environment specifically for a little bit um, and, and really fall in love with it. And then when you get uh, that urge, urge to get back into the instrument uh, phase, that'll be there um, and you'll be set up in a good position to do that. that. That's what I did. It was a year, almost exactly. It was a little over a year. It'll be a year and two months by the time we actually start. And the, the catalyst for me 
was I've been frustrated a handful of times about not being able to leave Fairmont because of a like the entire flight. I had a would have been a three hour flight. I would have spent about forty seconds in the cloud layer going through it, and then it was like clear and a million the rest of the way to my destination. So we ended up making a nine hour drive a couple weeks ago um, that would have been an hour and fifty minute flight, and uh, that was when I I was so. That day was it for me. I, I texted Kevin the day, day and said, this is it. Like that's let's, I'm not doing, I'm done with this. I'm just done with this. There's no, <laughs> if you're going to just, if all you want to do as a hobbyist is fly around on sunny days and like, which is fine. And a lot of people do that if that's your intention. But like, if you, if you want to use your certificate to like be able to go places with any kind of pre-planned uh, mission, you can't not, I mean, it's just impossible. It's just impossible to do that. I think without an instrument rating, I just don't know how you can with any certainty expect that you can use the airplane for this a trip. Uh, you just, I don't know how you can do it. So, um, so you, you'll couple, come to Nashville and pick me up for things that I need to do though. Right. Well, I mean, you know, uh, if you'll pay your pro rate a share of uh, flight <laughs> expenses, I'll, then, I'll pay uh, my amateur rate a share. Miss <laughs> Ivy Geiler in the uh, chat room tonight said her her husband would like to know, Kevin, how did you get to be so awesome? Her husband Bill is uh, one of our club members, uh, also a midlife pilot, learning to fly, and he, frankly is also killing it. Uh, I think he's one of Kevin's students, but he has been, I think an exemplary, an example of someone in midlife who's taken it very seriously and really applied it. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and really it's a, it's a joy to instruct students like the passion and the dedication uh, for, for flying and, and, and they're, you know, 100% in it, you know, all the time. Um, you know, I think he, he soloed with uh, pretty low hours, similar to you, uh, Chris. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a blast uh, of flying with Bill. Uh, what does that say? Rog Little wants to know, how many days a week do you recommend to take flight training? I'm going to assume that is primary training. Uh, let's go on that assumption. I think it's less important maybe the day, you know, how many days a week – for instruments, probably a little less important because there's uh, probably less. I don't know, maybe not, but you have a recommendation on uh, how many times a week you should fly while training? Yeah, I say if you, um, I say twice a week it is a pretty good number. Um, if you know you're in, in a busier area or maybe maybe funds are an issue, at least once a week, uh, so you can stay in the plane. But I think two is a good a good middle ground. It, it's a good number to stay in the plane, but still give you time to stay on top of, uh, your, your book work uh, essentially. Um, and then three, obviously, if you're lucky enough to be able to fly three times a week, um, I would say that'd probably be the max, um, at least for primary training, just because it's a lot to really, really kind of let that absorb between every lesson. Um, and then you can stay, you flew stay a lot. along with your training, the books. You flew pretty regularly, didn't you, Brian? You're, like mine was really spread out. We've talked about this. Mine took me like two and a half years, including a gap in the middle of like seven months where I didn't have a single lesson. And so mine was so irregular. I went through phases where Tyler and I were flying like three, maybe even four times a week. And then there were periods where it would go like every other week for an hour. And just like, it was so regular. But I remember you, you had some pretty, yours was pretty consistent. You flew a lot. Yeah, I ended up, uh, I was kind of looking back at my logbook and you know how like in four flight, it'll sort of separate it by the month and you can kind of see, I, I, I was, I think averaging probably about between 12, 14 flights a month. Um, so whatever that amounts to three times a week, sometimes maybe a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes a little bit less. I was kind of wanting to go at, it, depending on what phase of the training it was, when I was building up to the point where I was about to solo and it was just about pattern work and just getting landings down um, and, it, and the focus had become very singular, I wanted to go every day because I just wasn't getting it and I just wanted to get it. And, uh, and then things could kind of spread out a little bit more when it was more about cross country and, uh, you know, and check ride prep and things that had a lot of other sort of menu items around it. Um, but yeah, I flew a lot. Um, I, I, I started April 22nd and I got my license on the 23rd of September. 
So about five months exactly. Um, and considering the weather here in Nashville, and then there were a ton of delays. I probably could have done it in three months um, if if there were no delays. And so that's what I was going to say to your point, Kevin, was like, um, you know, a friend of mine who's just starting, you know, she was curious about how, how often she should fly. And I said, um, sign up for three flights a week because one won't happen every week um, at least. And that way you still get your two flights and you have some insulation against that week off kind of thing happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything in aviation, you know, is weather or maintenance uh, <laughs> or plane availability, something, something's always, always going to happen there. So yeah, that, that's a great system scheduling. Or when your instructor is like, to. Oh, you know what? I've got to go do some Cirrus training, uh, you know, in another state. Um, where I'm going to make so much more money than dealing with your, you know, 172 training. Um, so yeah. So we have we have nine minutes left. I'm gonna I want to run through a handful of questions real quick that have come in because I think some of these are good. And this one, Kevin, this is pretty much for you uh, from One Dog Geek again. Are there any risks that you see going straight into instruments? So like you get your private certificate on Saturday and Monday is instrument lesson one. You guys probably do that a lot. I would assume at the flight school level, I would think for efficiency sake, are there, do you, do you do that? And are there risks do you think going straight into it or is it better? Um, yeah, we definitely do that. Um, in the flight school setting, uh, that's exactly how we do things. You finish your private, um, and then you go right into instrument, you know, um, I don't really see any risk uh, associated with it. I think instrument definitely makes you a better pilot overall. Uh, gives you a better feel for the airplane. Um, gives you a better handle of procedures, and it give gives you an out if you ever you know do get into the the IFR conditions that uh, obviously a private pilot might not be as equipped to handle. So yeah, so, yeah, I don't see any um, one right in instrument. That risk would that risk would certainly I would think out outpace any risk associated with starting the training early, like inadvertent IMC. I don't know that there's a much greater risk, you know, truthfully at the young private level, um, in my opinion. Uh, another great question: We've got some folks, Indiana Penny, and some of these have been great tonight. If there are multiple CFIs to choose from, how do you know which one to choose? For example, I'm wondering if a midlife pilot would learn better from a fellow midlife pilot. I definitely have opinions on this. I don't, and I'm going to just, I'm just going to let it rip. And then you guys can, cause I've also have the mic and I'm talking currently. I think, I don't think I could have found a better match for my primary training for me than Tyler was. It was completely happenstance. And it's not like I got to audition instructors, right? So it just, I couldn't find one. I could not get into the local flight school that's available to us. Not, not Kevin's like, collegiate program but um and i it was a random facebook thing it was like anybody know an instructor and anybody find an airplane and we just kind of got hooked up with people so it was completely happenstance and he's way younger than me so we're not we're not even close on the age i mean we're at least uh i don't know 15 years apart probably Uh, i don't know how old tyler is but uh from a personality standpoint we were perfect he's about as laid back and chill about everything like nothing is going to kill anybody and everything's fine all the time and like let's just go fly the airplane and i was the in the complete (laughs) reciprocal of that like everything was a disaster we're going to die every lesson because everything (laughs) fails and the plane's going to fall apart or i'm you know it's just i was a spaz pretty consistently and he, it didn't phase him one iota right i mean i remember all of his little sayings like it was just like stop being an idiot like just go do this thing like what's your problem everything's fine you know there's a lot of that so he we just i think it has more in my opinion and you guys can answer it has more to do with personality and like learning style and teaching style being a match and also just getting along with people i've been really fortunate truthfully like between tyler just the we have a we just have a great network of people i've, I've not got to fly believe it or not i've not got to fly with sam our other one of kevin's friends who teach with him at fairmont state and also an instructor in our club i don't know how that's possible that at this point i have not flown even a flight with him but like kevin and i have done a few lessons together in, in the 235 like he got me checked out when we got that plane 
and Kevin also is really good. Like he has a very similar personality. I think to Tyler, like the, it just kind of, um, anyway, compliment me. And I think it's a good fit. And I think this is going to be a good fit for instrument. Um, and we're flying, we're going to be flying the plane that we both own together. I mean, there's just a lot of synergies here for us. Um, I think in that you guys have input on, uh, Brian, what do you think about the age? Does it matter? I mean, I think it's obviously more about fit than anything else uh, or having somebody that's complimentary. I don't mean like in a, um, I mean, like as a good example, you know, my instructor, definitely 20 years younger than I am. Um, and he's very laid back. Um, but he was also one thing I really learned to appreciate about his style was that he wasn't really, he wasn't easy on me. He didn't uh, sugarcoat things. And I, I, I respond, I think well to that. I've seen uh, other instructors, you know, that are, you know, and some people really like this where it's sort of like, you know, a lot of reassurance, a lot of positive, uh, you know, feedback along the way and just really trying to keep somebody's spirit up the whole time. I think that, I think that my, my instructor would, um, I don't know, sometimes kind of break me down a little bit, you know what I mean? Like it was kind of a, you know, uh, man, I really thought I did something great. It takes like, what do I have to do to get this guy to be like, Oh my God, that was a great landing or just something. And then when he finally would respond to something and be like, Oh, you know, damn, like that was, you know, it was like, uh, wow, okay, I really know for sure that I, I, I did something great. So I, I think I benefited from that sort of somewhere, you know, uh, if, if you're self-loathing like myself, I think to have a little bit of tough love is, is a good thing. Um, but um, but that, was, that was my experience. I think that, I don't know if that's really about age as much as um, maybe experience. You know, he, even though he's young, he had, you know, a lot of students prior to me and and uh, I think he knew how to deal with, you know, people like me. And I think that a good instructor will kind of know how to be a chameleon or shape shift to, uh, you know, better adapt to that type of student. The, the better instructors, I think, can do that. Very good. Um, one more question it is three minutes, three minutes remaining. I don't know why I feel like I have to have a countdown. It's not like we're in a hard out here. Um Brian and Chris and Kevin, this will be fun to ask Kevin too. How many hours did you have when you passed your private check ride? I don't know exact. I don't have my logbook exactly. Uh, I think I had like 60. It realistically could have been 40. I mean, we had a little game. Tyler was trying to get me done at four. Like he was like, this is what we should try to do. We probably could have done it. I was, I really was, my check ride was a, it took me a lot to get to that point and I was scared and we took a bunch of check ride prep lessons, a bunch, a ton. And then I got delayed three times, but I was taking it at Clarksburg. So I ended up flying, I mean, probably five or six more hours, at least maybe more, you know, just in the delay weather delays between check rides. So I think I was right about 60. Where were you at, Brian? I was a, about 65 and had a similar kind of thing towards the end where it was really um, the prep was kind of there, but it was about being primed and in a good spot at the right time up to the appointment and battling weather and stuff like that. Yeah. 65 hours. Kevin, do you even remember 1100 hours ago when you got your, uh, <laughs> private, how many hours you had? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, about 42 and a half. Oh, uh, there you go. Hey, um, I got a quick thing yeah. for Kevin. I know we got to go, but listen, I, what I really like to get from CFIs is, um, and I'll give you an example of this, uh, you know, my CFI just told you about when he, when I went on my first solo that was sort of, you know, out to the practice area or whatever that, you know, the kind of first solo that where you actually take off the plane by yourself and do all the things by yourself. I told him, I said, you know, when I got back, I was like, you know what? I just got out there and I was so excited just to be kind of flying. I just kind of buzzed around. I did a few steep turns, came back. Like I didn't really go through a bunch of stuff. And he was like, oh man, that's no problem. He said, he said, I was so freaked out when I went out to the practice area for the first time. I, I literally just uh, flew out there and just went in one giant, huge circle and then came back. I was just so freaked out that I was even doing this. So I guess, you know, for, to try to humanize these superhuman uh, CFIs or CF double eyes, um, you know, what, what, uh, what moments of actual learning and insecurity did you have when you were, when you were at our low hours? Uh, yeah. So, if any. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there's definitely plenty of opportunities for learning. Um, 
you know, one, it was on my first or second practice area solo i can remember uh i went out um with a scattered layer out there um nothing too crazy i mean it was four thousand feet or so um but yeah while i was out there um it kind of closed up uh a little bit and dropped a little bit so um you know that was that was a, a learning curve kind of thing um you know that was one of the things you know, I'm supposed to do all these stalls, but you know, I'm out there. It's like, oh, I'm just watching these clouds come down. I'm just going to kind of fly around here and get back to Clarksburg as soon as I can. Uh, so yeah, the definitely there's lots of those kinds of things that happen uh, on your solos, but uh, what they're, they're there for it is uh, an aspect uh, of it. Awesome. Well, Kevin, I can't thank you enough uh, for taking an hour on a night uh, away from everything to do this at short notice. It was great to have uh, this. This was a great topic to have a uh, instructor like you with the perspective of both all the ages of pilots. And so I think it was super beneficial to get your input on all that. And uh, so thanks for coming tonight and hopefully we'll get to do more with you in the future. Uh, and stay tuned everybody for instrument uh, training with uh, Kevin and me in the 235 and the 172 Lord willing um, getting ready to fly to uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio to pick up a piece of sheet metal. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, hopefully we'll get this thing flying again here soon. But uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you, Kevin, for being here. And um, we'll do this again with you soon. Okay. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kevin. It was awesome. So a couple of housekeeping things, Brian. Let's work in real quick before we go. Uh podcast is out now please look for it if you are a podcast person at your podcast place of choice right we'd love to get that uh rolling and and make the content available to you to listen to in the car or whatever and share it with your friends share it in groups if you want to um kind of help get the word out about this um thank you for all the questions tonight was very very good um in fact, I guess, uh, yeah, we have more than we even got to tonight, which was awesome. And um, we'll keep doing these live. Uh, we're going to try to stick to this Wednesday night schedule. I think it's working out pretty well. We'll see how this works. Um, that you, what just else, jinxed Brian? It. you just jinxed it. There's no way we're going to make it one more week because um, it just seems to be going so well. No, um, no, I think that's, that's it. I think the Wednesday thing will work generally. And if it doesn't, you know, like, well... We'll come back the, the next Wednesday and it'll be all right. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so the audio, I, I, the audio should be up, I think, uh, maybe sometime tomorrow. Um, and, you know, uh, if everybody goes and clicks and does all the things, I guess that's good. And, and um, you know, more than anything, uh, I've always just kind of been interested to do this because I, I don't know about a lot of the people here, but um, I went through a lot of this stuff by myself. I didn't have anybody to commune with or anybody to call or, or anything when I was going through the, the hardest parts of my training. And so I was really determined to make an effort to put myself out there and meet people. And, um, and so I appreciate everybody being here and, and allow me to kind of do that. Absolutely. The community has been it for me too. That's really the reason that I think, um, the, all of this thing are all of these things that we're working on the YouTube channel, like the continuation of the midlife pilot channel, this podcast. I mean, this nobody's getting, nobody's getting, this is not a get rich. This is not a money making venture, but I do love finding groups of people who are like-minded with common interests um, to kind of support each other and share content. And um, it's just been great. And this is just one more extension and I'm really looking forward to developing this podcast with you and with this whole community and getting this stuff going. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. This was fun. We'll do it again uh, next week. Look for that podcast audio coming out tomorrow. Subscribe wherever you do. And, uh, I guess we'll talk to, uh, talk to everybody next week. Sound good. Appreciate it, everybody. All right. Good night, everybody.